The purpose of this video is to give first timers the confidence and the tools they need to get started making their sauerkraut. Hi, welcome to the Daddy Kerbs Farm, a place where we believe everyone has a story and every story counts. More specifically today, welcome to the Daddy Kerbs Kitchen. I'll be showing you how I make my sauerkraut. Hopefully when we're finished with this video you will have the confidence and the skills, the tools that you need to make your first batch of sauerkraut. We're going to talk about the cabbage, the fermenting container, the mixing bowl, the salt, and the weights and followers. We are fermenting cabbage, that's what sauerkraut is, so let's talk about the cabbage first. Preferably, we would all be fermenting our cabbage that comes out of our garden so it's the most fresh, but I don't grow cabbage well here on the Daddy Curbs farm. Some people don't have a garden at all, so I did purchase this, and you can purchase cabbage usually very inexpensively at your local grocery. And I'm going to give you a few tips about things to look for when choosing your cabbage. I like to make my sauerkraut with both red and green cabbage in the same batch. It makes it a beautiful color and I think the flavor is really nice. Let's talk about what to look for when you're purchasing your cabbage at the grocery. First of all, the cabbage should be nice and dense and tight and fairly heavy for its size. If the leaves are really loose, then that means it's an older head of cabbage and it's probably a little drier and tougher than it would be if it's tighter and heavier with more moisture. Another thing you can look for is the sheen on the, on the leaf. If it is especially dull, then it's probably dried out and not suitable for fermenting. The next thing we're going to talk about is the fermenting container. Now we're going to keep this really simple. I use one gallon pickle jars. Now there are a lot of people that choose different ways to ferment, different containers, different crocks. There's a lot of really cool crocks that you can purchase for fermenting, but if you're just getting started and you don't know what to purchase but you want to get started right away, you don't have to get anything fancy. A glass container or a ceramic container, you have to be careful with anything glazed. Then there's a possibility of lead being in that glaze and you have to have that tested before you use it for fermenting. For me, I just like to keep it simple with a glass container. You can use a lid or not. I don't tighten the lid down anyway, I just use it to help keep bugs and whatever, you know, things out of it. I never tighten it down, that way all of the CO2 that's in there can escape, but we'll talk more about that in a little bit. Your fermenting container can be a quart-sized canning jar, a pickle jar, anything such as that. Glass, typically, most people agree, is the best. Now let's talk about the mixing container. You're going to need a large bowl to mix your cabbage in. What type of material should the bowl be made from? A lot of people are very concerned at this point about metal, even plastics, and sometimes it's difficult to know what to use. I'm using a plastic large mixing bowl, but at this stage, because your ferment is not acidic yet, you can use a large stainless steel mixing bowl Generally, you don't want metal touching your fermented foods, but in the beginning, before it's fermented, while you're mixing, a large stainless steel bowl won't hurt. Now the salt. There are so many different types of salt, many varieties, and there's a lot of different salts that will work just fine in your fermented foods. I happen to like Himalayan pink salt. It's full of minerals. It doesn't have the added iodine, which you don't want, so don't use regular table salt that has added iodine. Just check that out when you're choosing your salt. I can't go far in depth because I don't know all the science behind the salts. All I know is that Himalayan pink salt works really well. It tastes good and has the benefit of lots of minerals. The basic concept of making sauerkraut is combining chopped cabbage and salt in such a way that it creates a brine and ferments. Notice that I mentioned only two ingredients. There is the cabbage and the salt. Some people who make sauerkraut like to add extra things because they think it's better flavor or they put whey in it to help put the, uh, to increase the bacteria at the beginning. But cabbage by itself has the bacteria needed to make sauerkraut and traditional sauerkraut is only two ingredients, cabbage and salt. 
Let's get started by taking this head apart, this head of cabbage, and I'll show you how to clean it up and prepare it for your ferment. You need to wash your hands thoroughly. I like to use a all natural detergent that doesn't have any of the uh, chemicals in it. Just nice clean soap. And definitely not an antibacterial soap because that could mess with the bacterias that you're wanting to foster and nurture in your ferment. So just as an extra added uh, precaution, don't use antibacterial soap. We're gonna wash these heads of cabbage. Just rinsing them off at first. Get the outside rinsed off. And we're gonna pull these large exterior leaves that are kind of loose and set those aside because we're gonna use those later in the process. Normally there's only two or three that are loose. That one's still kind of tight. I'll leave that one on. You rinse this off. All right, so we have the large outer leaves that we're gonna use in part of the process and then the heads themselves. So when I get started with a head of cabbage, I typically will just cut it in half and then just cut the heart out or the core. Your rabbits will enjoy that. inside there that nice tightly packed head of cabbage there shouldn't be a lot of air gaps between the leaves before I get too far with the cabbage I want to talk about the salt and how much salt we're going to use I had to do a little bit of math for this and I don't know if I would explain it correctly in the video I'll do my best my cabbage was 8.3 pounds I know that because I weighed it on a scale uh, you can also know that by when you weigh it at the grocery store, a lot of times the amount of weight, they're usually purchased by weight, and that is printed on the receipt. So you can know how much your cabbage weighs simply by looking at the receipt in most cases. So the recipe or the suggested amount of salt for cabbage is somewhere between 2 to 3% of the weight of cabbage. So I took... 8.3 pounds times 16 because that gives me ounces and then multiply the ounces by 2 and 3 percent to get how many ounces I would need for this. At 2 percent it would be 2.656 ounces of salt and then also at 3 percent 3.984. So roughly two and a half to four ounces by weight of salt. I don't have a kitchen scale right now that works so I had to convert the weight of salt into actual measurements. So I went online and found a calculator for the weight of Himalayan salt and found out that uh, the two and a half to four percent would be roughly a little more than one third of a cup. So about that much. Keep in mind that this doesn't have to be precise. It can be more or less salt there's a trick to knowing if it's going to be good for you, and that is that you taste your cabbage with salt as you're going through the process. And if it's too salty in the beginning, it's going to be too salty as sauerkraut. If it's not salty enough, then you're going to have to add more salt in the beginning to make the sauerkraut flavor that you like. We're at the stage where we are going to be preparing our cabbage. Those large outer leaves that are now washed, stack them up and set them aside. We don't want to cut those up. So we're gonna take our cabbage and slice it. You can use a slicer if you like, but I just use a knife on a cutting board and I try to keep it fairly thin. I try to make each slice less than a quarter inch thick. Notice that I did not do a lot of chopping. I kept the strands fairly long, but I don't want them really thick. Wow, that is a lot of beautiful cabbage. When you get done chopping your cabbage, you might think, I have too much cabbage. But keep in mind that as you 
uh, prepare the cabbage, it will condense, get smaller in size, and you're going to pack it tightly into a jar. So you're going to need a lot more than you think. This might be a little much for my jar, but let's see if we can get it all in here. After chopping, is that we're going to start mixing it and massaging it uh, to get the salt incorporated. The salt's going to work with that cabbage, breaking down fibers, pulling out the moisture, and creating a brine. The brine is the liquid from the vegetable that the salt brings out. All of this right here, that's brine from this batch. That's no added extra water. So when we start preparing this, we're going to break this cabbage up. We're going to put a layer in our mixing bowl. This is the entire amount of salt for the whole batch. So I like to keep that in mind as I go along and just add a little bit in layers and massaging that in, then adding more cabbage, adding a little salt. And just keeping this, this mix and this paste, kind of layering it, cabbage and salt. When you're doing this and you're thinking about a massage, you need to think about deep tissue massage. None of this light back rub stuff. It's deep tissue. Within minutes, you should start to notice your cabbage getting wet because it's pulling moisture out and sort of wilting just a little bit. That's what you want to see, and your, your massaging is helping to break down those fibers to make it a little softer. Now your mixing bowl is probably not big enough for the whole batch, so we're going to do this in layers. You want to make sure that your, everything that you mix in the bowl is nice and massaged. I keep using that word, but it really is about getting in there and, and squishing it together, mashing it down, breaking the fibers a little bit. You don't want to chew it all up, but you do want to make sure that cabbage is well worked. As you're doing this process here, you may notice that yours isn't really getting that moist. It's possible that you started with a, a head of cabbage that wasn't fresh enough or moist enough. So you might have to add more salt and give it more time and press on it a little more, work it a little more to get the, the moisture that's in there out. This batch is looking pretty good. When I pick it up, I can see the water coming off of it and I can feel the water on my hands. So this is working. When, if you look down in here, you can see the water pooling at the bottom. That's the natural brine coming out of the cabbage. Okay, I clearly don't have enough room in my mixing bowl to do everything. We're gonna get started in our container here, our ferment container. And the first, after you get this worked and you get a lot of nice moisture building up there, then we're gonna start layering it into the ferment container. So we'll put an inch or two on the bottom. And I like to just use my hands as tools. You can use a plunger or, you know, like a, a flat end French style. I think they're French style rolling pens that don't have the handles and mash it in there. But I just like to use my hand, press it down with my fist. Pack it in real tight and then just add another layer of cabbage. Another couple handfuls on there. Just keep pressing. As you press, you're going to start to see that liquid start to form. And eventually, you'll see that liquid, that brine, start to rise up above the top, the surface of the cabbage. I think we're gonna get it all in there. That whole first bowl uh, made uh, less than half a jar. Now we don't wanna fill this all the way up. We're gonna go a couple inches from the rim, giving some headspace because it will swell as it ferments. But we're looking good. 
I may not have stressed it enough earlier that as you're doing this, one of the ways that you're going to know if the finished product is going to turn out to your, your taste, your flavor preference, is to actually take a little bit and taste it. And this batch is just a pinch salty. It's not too bad. But what that tells me is that I probably will not, in fact, I will not use the entire amount that I had set aside for this. I'm going to go a little light on this, this second half. If that moisture isn't working for you, one thing you can do is you add your salt, you massage, you can cover it with a towel or a lid and walk away from it for about 45 minutes to an hour and then come back and work it again. By that time, the salt that's in there has had time to really draw that moisture out and it's gonna help. Now here, I'm gonna play it safe and not add this last bit because I know that sometimes it swells more than I expect and I don't want that to spill over into my pantry. Just in case you're worried about that, you can place this on like a cookie sheet, something that has a lip that's gonna catch that moisture if it does happen to come out. But for me this time, I'm going to just play it safe and not add the rest of this. But I did work pretty hard for this brine. So I'm gonna pour that in there. All right, we are getting to that point where we're gonna finish this off. So I'm just pressing, and notice every time that liquid, that brine, just keeps getting thicker and thicker at the top. The more I pack it down, the more liquid comes to the surface, and that's exactly what we want. All right. Now, that looks really nice. We are there to the point to where we're going to need these leaves that we cut off in the beginning. In a ferment, there's your fermented vegetables with your brine, and then there's a layer called a follower, and also a layer called a weight. The follower is basically a leaf or a silicone uh, sheet or something like that that you're laying in to help keep all of that, uh, those cut veggies down below that brine surface. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this leaf here and we're going to use it to push down on top. Let me turn that one over. Alright, those leaves are going to help keep all that cut cabbage down below the surface. Using my fingertips on the edges to help press it down. That's the primary follower, that's the first follower over the cut veggies. Now there has to be a weight and some people use even a secondary follower which is another layer. The baggy trick is one that satisfies both of those, it's a weight and secondary follower at the same time. So the baggy thing, a lot of people are going to say, no, 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 you can't put plastic in there. In most cases, you're correct. But the freezer bags, from everything that I could read and research, they don't have the BPA or other chemicals in it that are going to leach into your food. So uh, the freezer bags, like I said, by everything I read, are safe. So we're going to open a bag. We're going to spread the bottom of the bag out into the top of that. Just kind of push it around the edges. Now that that bag is pressed in there around all the edges, we're gonna fill it up with a water that, we're gonna use filtered water from the refrigerator and I'm gonna add a little bit of salt. The reason I'm adding salt is just in case this bag leaks. I don't want it putting fresh water into my ferment. Uh, that could mess with the texture and flavor. So we're putting salt water into our bag here. And I'm going to help make sure it spreads out. I still want to leave the layer, see I'm still an inch to an inch and a half uh, below the surface there. 
there's there's a possibility of it swelling so I need to make sure that there's room for it to swell so now I'm going to try to press as much air as I can out of this and then zip it up we're going to zip it up most of the way and then press the air out and zip it up tight I'm going to try to keep that zip that uh, ziplock top facing up just in case there would be some leakage around that lock or that seal so basically what we've created there is a weight to hold down everything that's in there with still some headspace and hopefully that bag doesn't leak I have not yet had a bag leak on me but I know that it's possible uh, not all bags are created perfectly but I do trust the system I've used it several times and it works out really well so now that that is all packed up I could leave it just like that as an extra layer of protection from things getting into it I'm putting the lid that comes with the jar on there I'm not tightening it down I'm gonna just tighten it a little bit so it holds on but the CO2 the carbon dioxide that is produced in here from the, the uh, bacteria as it eats up the sugars in the cabbage and it ferments the cabbage it's gonna be releasing CO2 I need that to be able to get out I don't want air to get past this bag and into the cabbage that's why there's the brine layer the follower and the bag and then the added protection of just having a cover on it you can put a towel with a rubber band or cheesecloth or something like that but I find that this works pretty well too just a loose lid all right this is the difference between a cabbage ferment sauerkraut that done just like this one after about three weeks so when it first starts out because I like to use the white or green cabbage along with the red it's gonna look all different layers and different colors but it'll become this beautiful uh, pinkish color as it ages that leads me to the next question which many people will have is how long do you let it ferment when does it become sauerkraut well that's gonna depend on your preference your flavor your palate um, after about seven days technically it's fermented and it is sauerkraut some people really like that young sauerkraut flavor other people believe it's not really sauerkraut until it's been fermenting for at least 30 days many diehards will go six months or longer before they really feel like they have a good sauerkraut well that is truly up to your preference your flavor I happen to like it right around the 30 day mark so I'm gonna wait another week on this one and I'll be happy to put this in the pantry beside it letting it ferment that way by the time I'm done with this one this one should be ready when you put this away for storage you're gonna to want to put it somewhere that doesn't get a lot of light uh, the temperature is gonna be fairly stable room temperature is gonna be fine but you're not gonna want it to get extremely cold or extremely hot so put it away in the dark put a towel over if you have to and don't disturb it until it gets to that level that your uh, that you prefer as far as timing when you start doing your fermented uh, veggies you can dive so far into buying special crocs and special weights and special lids and all kinds of things that cost a lot of money but I wanted to give you this example to show you that you can do this at home with a very inexpensive start pickle jars a lot of times I find these at yard sales or people give them to me or if you can find a place that sells pickles by the gallon in a glass jar buy pickles share the pickles with your friends and keep the jar if you feel like you just have to purchase the jar you can get them in this size on Amazon as well please do check out my playlist called in the kitchen there's things from kombucha to uh, pumpkins pumpkin seeds lemon peel making powder from lemon peels and now the sauerkraut it's just a fun list it's a fun thing that we do here on the farm preserving our food check out that playlist leave your comments below about how you do your sauerkraut if you feel like I've made an error please let me know if you are here for the first time and you are happy about uh, the tutorial and you've done this and you turned out well please let me know that as well it has been my pleasure here in the daddy curbs kitchen showing you how I make my sauerkraut subscribe hit that notification bell the like button all those good things that YouTube likes and I'll talk to you soon <clears throat> thanks for making my kombucha video a success 
If you haven't checked that out yet, head over to that video when you're done here so you can learn how to make kombucha at home as well.